So gravitational waves are a prediction of Einstein's general theory of relativity. When Einstein first proposed general relativity in 1916, an, an essential piece of that theory was the existence of gravitational waves. So what are these gravitational waves? They are essentially the ripples of space-time itself. So if you recall Einstein's method of looking at gravity was to not think of it as a force, but to think of it as curvature of space-time. And so if you think, the, the simplest analogy, of course, one can think of, which is not completely accurate, but it works pretty well, is to think of a, a membrane or a cushion, and in the center of that you put a bowling ball. And now what happens is that the cushion curves inwards, and if you put a little playing marble at the edge, that playing marble falls in towards the bowling ball. And that was Einstein's way of thinking of gravity. Gravity is geometry. Now the piece of it that gravitation, where, where does gravitational waves come in? It comes in, in, in the, this idea that gravity is not just static. But imagine you took this bowling ball and you uh, vibrated it up and down. And now what would happen is on the surface of your, of your membrane or cushion, there would be little ripples. And those ripples would go outward from the bouncing ball. Very similar if you would drop a rock in a pond and those ripples go outward. So gravitational waves are essentially radiated by very massive objects when those, ob those mass distributions or those objects accelerate. And they go outward from that object and out into the universe. So if you take, for example, a, some sort of you know, a, a, a source in the sky, like a pair of neutron stars or a pair of black holes that are orbiting each other, as they orbit each other, they are radiating gravitational waves. And those gravitational waves are traveling outward from the source towards us as observers. So the research that I'm involved in is called the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. So it's a very long mouthful, but just in short, we call it LIGO. And what it is, is it's a, a pair of observatories that is designed to go out and directly measure these gravitational waves. So let me just say, we have never directly observed these as yet. But there is actually very compelling indirect evidence. And that indirect evidence actually came to us uh, in the form of uh, signals, radio signals uh, from a radio pulsar. So in 1973, I think it was, um, Taylor and Hulse discovered a pulsar. And pulsars are, are, are beautiful objects in the sky. They're neutron stars. Now, how are they different from ordinary stars? Well, neutron stars are they have the same mass as our sun almost, but they're only 10 kilometers in, in radius. So they're very, very small, which means they're extremely dense. And so these, one of the things that happens with these very dense neutron stars is they have very strong magnetic fields. And those magnetic fields make the light that's being emitted by the star get very heavily beamed. So it's like a little lighthouse. And as the neutron star spins on its axis, the lighthouse beam uh, goes through our line of sight. So Hulse and Taylor were looking at these light pulses using uh, a radio telescope, the Arecibo telescope, and they noticed something very interesting. Usually, these pulsars the, are very good timekeepers. The, the light beam crosses your line of sight at a very regular interval. But this pulsar that they noticed, it had, uh, it had a, a periodicity where those pulses were not exactly regular. They would speed up, and then about eight hours later, they would slow down, and they would speed up again. And when they looked at this more system more carefully, they realized that this pulsar was part of a binary system. It had a companion star. And those two stars together were in a very relativistic uh, orbit with each other. They were very close to each other, and their gravity is so strong that they were, rel they were a relativistic system. And if they're a relativistic system, then by Einstein's theory, they should be radiating these gravitational waves. So they actually measured the rate at which these two pulsars, over many years, by the way, the rate at which these two pulsars were getting closer to each other. These two, well, actually only one was a pulsar. These two, this pulsar and its companion, were getting closer to each other. And by measuring the rate at which they get closer to each other, they could then calculate how much energy is being lost by that system. Now, where does that energy go? It gets carried away by the gravitational wave. 
So they were able to do this beautiful measurement where we, they showed a, an exact match to Einstein's prediction for how much energy should be carried away by this relativistic system. So it's widely believed that that is the, you know, that's a definitive uh, 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 you know, observation that gravitational waves are radiated by these astrophysical, these relativistic astrophysical systems. And indeed, in fact, uh, it's, it's so widely be uh, uh, believed uh, that Halston Taylor also re received the Nobel Prize for this work in 1993. So we believe they're out there, and now what LIGO is trying to do is to directly detect them, to say, not to say we can see, we can infer that gravitational waves are being radiated by watching the energy drop in the system by measuring the radio waves, but to directly measure the gravitational wave. So how do you measure a gravitational wave directly? So we all know, we learned very early in our physics education that gravity is a very weak force, right? So there's no surprise then that gravitational waves are very, very faint. And so let me put a scale on, on how faint uh, these gravitational waves are. They're so faint, by the way, that when Einstein first proposed them and sort of looked at the first calculations of how, how faint they would be, he was very depressed uh, uh, by it. And in fact, he even has a sentence in his paper about, how, how, you know, about his pessimism for, for them being observed. Um, so let's again go back to the system, the Hulse-Taylor system, which is a, a pair of neutron stars. And we can ask if we wanted to directly measure the gravitational wave from the Hulse-Taylor um, binary, you know, uh, how strong would that radiation be? So to know how strong it would be here on the Earth, the first question we have to ask is, what does a gravitational wave look like here on the Earth? So what a gravitational wave does is as it passes through space, it stretches and shrinks the whole space-time itself. So imagine for a moment that a gravitational wave is coming straight at me from some distant source. It's coming straight at me. And if I were a region of space-time, which I am, I would be stretching and shrinking where I get wider and, sh and, and, and shorter and longer and and narrower, so I'm stretching and shrinking like this as the gravitational wave goes through me. Now, by how much am I doing that is the, is the real difficult problem. If we took the Hulse-Taylor binary and we asked what is its strength, the strength of a gravitational wave is measured in units of strain. Now, why strain? People are used to thinking, physicists are used to thinking of strain from ideas of, of mechanical engineering. It's, a, it's essentially a change in length per length. Now, it turns out that's a useful quantity because this is, it's like the gravitational wave is also like a tidal force. So what it does is it changes a region of space-time that's a length L by an amount delta L. So you can think of the strength of a gravitational wave as being equal to delta L over L. Okay. So as it comes through a region of space, I am an object of length L. It changes my size by an amount delta L. Now let's put some numbers on it. The Hulse-Taylor binary here on the Earth has a strain of 10 to the minus 18. That's in dimensionless units. If the gravitational radiation went through me and I'm an object of length approximately one meter, it is changing my size by 10 to the minus 18 meters. Now, let's think about that number. That is 1,000th the size of a proton. So it's a very, very weak effect. So now that we have some scale on this, let's try to think about whether we could be more clever about the measurement than just trying to measure the changes in my size at the level of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So the very first knob we have to turn as experimentalists is the gravitational wave amplitude uh, uh, the is a change in length per length. So if we could make this measurement over a much longer length, then we would ha be able to measure a, a, a much larger delta L, which is easier to do. So the first thing that we, we do is instead of using a meter long detector like me, we use kilometer long detectors. So LIGO ha uh, detectors are four kilometers long. And then the other thing I want to add is, if you look at systems like the Hulse-Taylor binary in our galaxy, there are very few of them. 
So if you want to really start to do astrophysics with these systems and measure many of them, then you want to be able to look further out than our own galaxy. So we set ourselves the goal of being able to, for the first phase of LIGO, being able to look out to the Virgo cluster. A new binary neutron star system in the Virgo cluster is about a thousand times farther than the one in th than the Hulse-Taylor binary. So we're allowing ourselves to see a, f a thousand times farther out. And then the, the strain that we wish to measure goes down to 10 to the minus 21. So the goal of LIGO is to try to measure um, gravitational wave strains at the level of 10 to the minus 21 using kilometer long detectors. Now, what does that mean in terms of how, what is the, the relative distances we have to, uh, uh, displacements we have to measure? The relative displacements we have to measure then correspond to about 10 to the minus 18 meters. So, we're still trying to measure something at the level that's a thousand times smaller than a proton, but now instead of using a lousy detector like me, we're using a very sophisticated interferometric detector. So let's talk about how LIGO works and how it makes this measurement. So the very simplest principle of the measurement is imagine for a moment that I have a laser and I have a mirror. And in the case of LIGO, that mirror is sitting four kilometers away from the laser. And I have a really, really good clock. So all I do is I shine the laser light on the mirror, the light reflects off the mirror and comes back to me, and I have a really good clock that can tell me how long it took the light to travel that distance. Now if a gravitational wave comes by, that distance changes, and my clock will measure a different time. And that's the principle of our measurements. If you conceptually boil it down to what, how to make such a measurement, we have only two really difficult things to do. The one is we have to make our mirror so, so still, more still than 10 to the minus 18 meters, so that it only move, its motion is, is, is dominated by the passing gravitational wave and not by everything else that tries to shake it. So that's our first really difficult task. And then the second piece of it is it's really quite useless to have such a still mirror if you don't have a way of measuring that small motion. And for that, we have to uh, also uh, prepare very carefully an optical readout system. So we have to uh, do interferometry. We use the laser light as a meter stick for measuring the position of the mirror. And so it's those two things that we do. And we, when we put it all together in, in these enormous kilometer scale observatories, the LIGO observatories, and there is a European partner, the Virgo Observatory, when we put this all together, we are now we have now be, uh, begun to explore the universe uh, looking for gravitational waves and the information they will carry.